New beginnings, an occasion to rejoice. You know, it's, it wasn't until this morning as I was driving here and it dawned on me the irony that we're talking about an occasion to rejoice in light of September 11th. And you know, what convicted me about that this morning was that sometimes even in our darkest times, we can still find a way to rejoice. We can still find a way to rejoice. So even in light of the terrorist attack 20 years ago and how horrible it was, we can still look to the Lord and find a way to rejoice through all these dark times. In fact, God gave us the command in 1 Thessalonians 5.16. It says, Rejoice always. In every circumstance, in all things, we are to find a way to rejoice. And in our scripture today, we do find an occasion to rejoice. For the characters involved at the time, however, we can also see an occasion for all people to rejoice across all time. The promised Messiah had come. Promised Messiah had come. Many years ago, God had ordained the events of history so that the Messiah would come at a certain point in time, and now the time had arrived. He was, he was announced by the angel Gabriel. First John, the precursor, was announced to Zechariah, and then Mary was announced to the, the coming Messiah, and she had a time of rejoicing. The promised Messiah had come, and the occasion certainly deserved a joyful praise. So as we read our scripture today, we're going to read in Luke chapter 1 again, starting at verse 39, going through verse 56. So if you would stand as we read the scripture. At that time, Mary got ready and hurried to a town in the hill country of Judea where she entered Zechariah's home and greeted Elizabeth. And as you recall, this is right after Mary had the experience with Gabriel and Elizabeth had already um, was conceived as with child with John and Mary, the, the angel appeared to Mary and then after that experience, Mary hurried her way down to Zechariah and Elizabeth's house. It says, when Elizabeth heard Mary's greeting, the baby leaped in her womb. And Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit. In a loud voice, she exclaimed, Blessed are you among women, and blessed is the child you bear. But why am I so favored that the mother of my Lord should come to me? As soon as the sound of your greeting reached my ears, the baby in my womb leaped for joy. Blessed is she who has who has believed that the Lord would fulfill his promises to her. And then Mary said, My soul glorifies the Lord, and my spirit rejoices in God my Savior. For he has been mindful of the humble state of his servant. From now on, our generations will call me blessed. For the Mighty One has done great things for me. His holy is his name. His mercy extends to all those who fear him from generation to generation. He has performed mighty deeds with his arm. He has scattered those who are proud in their innermost thoughts. He has brought down rulers from their thrones, but has lifted up the humble. He has filled the hungry with good things, but has sent the rich away empty. He has helped his servant Israel, remembering to be merciful to Abraham and his descendants forever, just as he promised our ancestors. Mary stayed with Elizabeth about three months and then returned home. Let's pray together. Father, as we come before your throne right now to hear a word from you, Lord, it's not about me and what I've prepared. It's about what you want us to hear, Lord. I pray that you would use me as a vessel this morning, God, and speak to me and through me, Lord. Continue to prepare your people, Father, to meet you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. The first thing I want you to notice, there are three occasions or three ways that we can rejoice. 
we see Elizabeth's joyful experience. Elizabeth's joyful experience. Mary came to her, and as soon as Mary arrived at the house, Elizabeth recognized her voice and was blessed that Mary had come. And she rejoiced that Mary had come. And as soon as Mary started to speak, she felt this, some, this little kick inside of her belly. And she was overjoyed at this kick. Mary said, or Elizabeth said this of Mary. She said, blessed are you among women, and blessed is the child you bear. Notice, Wearsby, Warren Wearsby pointed out that Elizabeth said that Mary was blessed among women, not above women. She was blessed among women because of the child that she bore. Because Mary was blessed not simply because she had faith in God, but because she was bearing the Savior. And that's why she was blessed. And that's not an uncommon biblical theme, because most women in the Old Testament particularly, they were blessed because of the child that they bore. And as we'll see in a minute, when Mary goes into song, it's very similar to Hannah's song back in the Old Testament when she asked the Lord to give her a child, which she named Samuel, and then she in turn gave Samuel back to the Lord to serve in the temple. Blessed are you among women, and blessed is the child you bear. Elizabeth was then filled with the Spirit because of this experience. But secondly, I want you to notice John's joyful jump. John's joyful jump. As soon as Elizabeth heard Mary's voice, John jumped. He leaped in the womb. Now, it was very strange. It could have been a coincidence. Elizabeth could have seen it just as a mere coincidence, but she didn't. She understood how unique this was. And it's not uncommon because many biblical characters in the Old Testament, women who had babies, if they were to kick at a unique time, they would understand that to be something more than a coincidence, but a sign. And so Elizabeth interpreted this jump of John's as a sign. Because remember, what is John's purpose? To prepare the way for the Messiah, to announce the coming of the Messiah. Well, this was his first announcement. The Messiah is here, Mama. The Messiah is here. And Elizabeth understood and, and, and gathered that experience. And she was overjoyed with it. Next thing I want you to see, and this is we'll spend our rest of our time here, is Mary's joyful melody. Mary's joyful melody. She goes into this magnificent song. It's actually entitled in many translations, The Magnificent, which is a Latin word to means magnify the Lord. Mary's song. But there's some things that she, she identifies in this song that we can take and apply to our own life. I mentioned already that this is very similar to Hannah's song. So if you want to go back and read that as 1 Samuel chapter 2, verses 1 through 10, and I would encourage you to just go back and compare the two songs and see how similar they are in style and in word. A joyful song is often the means of expression of praise for what God has done. Matter of fact, the whole book of Psalms is actually a whole book of songs. You can, you can see the book of Psalms just like the, uh, the hymnal for the Israelite people. They were songs written to be sung in tune with a verse. Mary praised the Lord for the joy and blessing he had bestowed on her. And although she was honored to birth the Savior, she transferred that honor back to the Lord. What an appropriate example for us. Her purpose was to magnify the Lord for all he done, all he has done and plans to do. But first thing I want you to notice is Mary praised the Lord for his personal blessing over her life. Look at the first couple verses there, and you'll see the first person, first person pronoun, my. My soul glorifies the Lord, and my spirit rejoices in God, my Savior. 
She is thanking God for her personal salvation. God saved her. When's the last time you thank God for your salvation? He saved us. But God was also mindful of a servant. This servant girl named Mary, she calls herself God's servant. She's just a servant girl. But God was mindful of her. And the Greek word that is translated was mindful of means to look favorably upon or give special attention to. She did not think she deserved the special attention that she was getting from God. She didn't deserve to birth the Savior. Well, that's just the kind of person God likes to use. Someone with a humble heart. She was poor and a humble woman. Not the kind of woman people would traditionally expect God to come to. That's what the culture believed. But I want to remind us of 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 1, or verse 27 through 29. 1 Corinthians 1, 27 through 29. But God chose the foolish things of this world to shame the wise. God chose the weak things of this world to shame the strong. God chose the lowly things of this world and the despised things and the things that are not to nullify the things that are. So that one, no one may boast before the Lord. God likes to change culture and change our mental operations. Why? Because he wants to be glorified and he doesn't want us to glorify ourselves. God also selected her to birth the Messiah. He selected her. Does, does this mean that there were no other humble virgins in all of Israel that could have birthed the Messiah? Well, perhaps not, but perhaps so. The likelihood is that, yes, there were many. But God chose Mary. He chose Mary. And she understood that life. I know I'm not the only one you could have chosen, but you chose me. How awesome is that feeling? God says in Exodus 33, 19, I will have mercy on whom I will have mercy, and I will have compassion on whom I will have compassion. God chooses to have mercy and compassion on folks, not necessarily out of merit, although he does bless those who fear him. But Mary did fear God. And she was blessed. God's salvation of us should make us respond the same way Mary responded. He chose to save us. Not because we deserved it or because we earned it by any merit. He chose us out of his own compassion and mercy. You see, God's choosing of Mary to birth the Messiah is very, very symbolic of God choosing to save humanity entirely. God chose Mary to birth the Messiah, but he didn't have to choose anybody. He didn't have to come to be born of anybody. He didn't have to save us at all, but this is what he chose. And by God choosing Mary, he chose us to save us. And that is something we can rejoice in. Amen. Amen. God sustained her with his might. He sustained her with his might. Look at verse 49. For the mighty one has done great things for me. Holy is his name. Mighty one there means capable one or able one. God is able to do great things. Even make a virgin to give birth. Even make an old married couple, barren couple, give birth. He can do great things and there's nothing outside of the realm of possibility when it comes to God. He can do all things. Mary praised the Lord for his public blessing. Not only the personal blessing of her life, but the public blessing to everyone. Look at the transition here in verse 50. She goes from personal to everyone. His mercy extends to those who fear him. To those who fear him. He blesses those who fear him. Verse 50. By itself is kind of the summary verse of the next few verses. He explains it, or she explains it in a little bit more details in verses 51, 2, and 3. But verse 50 is kind of that summary section, summary verse there. 
Just as Mary feared God and was blessed, God blesses all those who fear him. But God does not extend mercy solely based on merit. Nonetheless, he does bless those who feared him. If you look at Psalm 103, verses 12 through 18, let me read this for you. Listen very carefully of what the writer of Psalm says. For as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is his love for those who fear him. As far as the east is from the west, so far has he removed our transgressions from us. As a father has compassion on his children, so the Lord has compassion on those who fear him. For he knows how we are formed. He remembers that we are dust. The life of mortals is like grass. They flourish like the, fl like the flower of the field. The wind blows over it, and it is gone. And its place remembers it no more. But from everlasting to everlasting, the Lord's love is with those who fear him. And his righteousness with their children's children. With those who keep his covenant and remember to obey his precepts. God blesses those who fear him. But not every blessing from the Lord is necessarily because someone has feared God. There are many who are blessed by God who do not fear him. Okay? There are many who are blessed by God because every good and perfect gift comes from him. So they may be experiencing the default blessing of God. However, for those who do fear him, have a special blessing. You're tracking? Warren Wiersbe identified three people groups Mary mentioned here. He identified the helpless, the humble, and the hungry. The helpless, the humble, and the hungry. God blesses the helpless, verse 51. He performs mighty deeds with his arm. He has scattered those who are proud in their innermost thoughts. Innermost thoughts. Mighty deeds with his arm. His arm symbolizes might and strength, particularly strength over the enemy. It's called an anthropomorphism. That's a fancy 50 cent word for you. It's a way to ex ex uh, explain God in human terms in ways that we can understand. His arm, his might, his strength is able to overcome any enemy. But look at the, the particular usage here. In verse 51, he has performed. The verb has performed or has done in some translation, Robert Stein says, it's best to understand this as the futuristic aorist tense. Okay? And what this means is it, it, it's equivalent to the Hebrew prophetic perfect tense. Now what that means is Mary is speaking in past tense of a future event. Does that make any sense? <laughs> in other words, she understands the promise God is planning to do, and she can talk about it as if it has already happened. That's how much confidence she has in what God is going to do. She can talk about it as if it's already happened. Amen? He is a mighty God, and he can watch over those who are helpless. Contextually, Israel at this time when Mary lived, Israel was enslaved by the Roman Empire. And when the announcing of the Messiah came, many people thought it was going to be a political over, overheal of the entire Roman army. And he was going to establish himself as a, as a king politically. But obviously we know that that doesn't happen. Matter of fact, he came to become a king of an even greater empire and conquer an even greater enemy, sin. Sin was the world's true captor. God also blesses the humble in heart. The humble in heart. God knows our thoughts, our inmost thoughts he is aware of. There's nothing that we can hide from God. David says, where can I go to escape your presence, Lord? If I go up to the heavens, you're there. If I go down to the earth, you're there. If I go down to Sheol, even you're there. In the highest mountain, you're in the deepest valley. There you are, Lord. 
I can't escape you. We can't escape God. Even in our innermost thoughts, He knows. And everything will one day be laid out on the table. That's a frightening thought. You ever met somebody who was living such an obviously rebellious life? But they hate to be called out about it. <laughs> then they come up with something like this, don't judge me, only God can judge me. You ever heard that before? You know, our proper response to that should be, and you should say that with great fear. <laughs> Do you realize what you have just said? That means an almighty, all-powerful, and perfect God is going to judge you. That's a frightening thought. Matter of fact, Scripture kind of highlights that as, as, a, as a motivation for us to kind of live right. Is that one day we're going to be judged for our deeds here. One day we're going to be judged for those deeds. God showing favor to the humble and despised and despising the proud. Sorry, God showing favor to the humble and despising the proud is a consistent theme throughout Scripture. Here's some verses to remind you of. 2 Samuel 22, 28. You save the humble, but your eyes are on the haughty to bring them low. 1 Peter 5, 5. All of you clothe yourselves with humility toward one another, because God opposes the proud, but shows favor to the humble and oppressed. And then Matthew 23, 12, Jesus says this, For those who exalt themselves will be humbled, but those who humble themselves will be exalted. God flips the table on the culture. The humble will be made high, and the highly will be made low. We need to humble ourselves before God because what, what leg do we have to stand on when we compare ourselves to a magnificent, holy God? We've got nothing. We would just do better to humble ourselves before Him. Why? He blesses the humble. He looked to Mary and saw how humble she was, and He blessed her. Matter of fact, it was said of Moses, God said of Moses, and he chose Moses because he was the most humble man on earth. Moses was a humble man. God used him mightily. God uses humble people, but he had a hard time using proud people. He has to first make them lowly. You would never, never know of a coach, or even in the military, when they go to boot camp or the first couple practices on a new, on a new year of a football team, the first couple weeks, is to break them, right? You're going to break them down and then build them up. That's kind of the idea of breaking our pride down so that he can build us back up again based on his strength and his alone, not on ours. A humble person is one who accepts God's ways and is obedient to him. Thus, receiving Christ is the most humbling thing that we can do when we lay down ourselves and receive Christ as our Lord. And at that moment, God richly blesses us. But not only does God bless the helpless and the humble, but he blesses the hungry. Look at verse 53. He has filled the hungry with good things and has sent the rich away empty. You see the contrast there of how God treats the rich and how God treats the hungry. It was often in that culture the, the rich would abuse the people that were lowly and hungry. There was even some problem with that within the church early on. But God cares for those who are hungry. He takes care of the needy. He meets our needs. He knows our needs. But it's not just the physical needs that he meets. You remember the Beatitudes? Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. For they will be filled. So not only is it a physical hunger, but a spiritual hunger. Although satisfying physical hunger is necessary for survival in this life, satisfying spiritual hunger is necessary for survival in the afterlife. Amen. Culturally, the helpless, the humble, and the hungry were lowly. They were considered unfavored by the Lord, somehow cursed 
by the Lord. The culture associated richness with God's favor. And although rich people are receiving God's blessing because every good and perfect gift comes from Him, their richness does not necessarily mean that God approves of them or that He has blessed them because of their righteousness. God reverses cultural customs because the last shall be first and the first shall be last. God does not operate within our cultural traditions. He operates under His. We have to adjust ourselves to His standards. So lastly, I want you to notice that Mary praised the Lord for His promised blessing. She praised, she praised the Lord for His promised blessing, verses 54 and 55. He has helped His servant Israel, remembering to be merciful to Abraham and his descendants forever, just as He promised our ancestors. She mentions Abraham and Jacob. These are the promises of old. When God says to Abraham, you'll be the father of many nations and I will establish your name forever. It's from your house I will bring the Savior. And Mary was realizing the connection that the promised Messiah was now being fulfilled. That old promise was, all, was now being fulfilled in her. And she was thanking God for all that he's done, his promised blessings. Mary was praising God expectantly that he would bring to fulfillment what he had promised through the Messiah. But what's this application to our lives today? What's the application to us? I'm sure you could probably pick up on some as we ran through this. But God was moving the lives of Elizabeth and Mary. To bring about the fulfillment of what was promised, the salvation of humanity. This wasn't an occasion for Mary to rejoice, and it's also an occasion for us to rejoice. God's movement should cause us excitement and joy. Amen. God's movement should cause us excitement and joy. But sometimes our joy is suppressed because we fail to be vigilant to see how God is working. We don't see him moving in our personal lives, and so even though he might be working, we just don't see it because we're not spiritually sighted. And we miss the blessing, and joy escapes us. God is always working around us. John 5 tells us that God the Father is always working. We just need to have eyes to see it and see the blessing that he has for us. But we can also rejoice with Mary for all that God has done, is doing, and will do. All that God has done, is doing, and we will do. As we reflect on all that God has done in history, building up to this event where the Messiah came, and even since the Messiah came all the way up till now, we can see all that he has done, and we can rejoice with Mary. As we reflect on all God is doing in our lives, currently, we can rejoice with Mary. And as we reflect on the promises of God yet to be fulfilled, you know what? We can rejoice as if they are already happened. Because God never backs down from a promise. He always fulfills His promises. You know, our world amply supplies us with reasons to be negative and to fall into depression and anxiety. We're not at a lack of that. We're constantly, constantly stimulated to be negative. Look at the news, it's constantly negative. And when we look at our world today and we see all the heartache and, and awful things going on, it can make us down and depressed. And what has happened is, you know, it's actually psych psychoanalysis here. Neurologically, it has programmed us to think negative almost by default. I want you to think of a, a woods or a jungle. And there's a beaten path through the jungle. Well, that beaten path through the jungle is very easy to travel because it's beaten. It's, it's, a, it's an easy road to travel. But when you start to blaze a new trail, 
You've got to cut down branches. You've got to smooth out the terrain. And it takes time and time and repetition for it to become a new beaten path. And our brain pathways actually work the same way. Neurologically speaking, if we're used to thinking a certain way, our neurological pathways in our brain have wired themselves to make the beaten path a negative path because that's what we constantly feed. And to rewire and blaze a new mental trail is going to take work. It's going to take repetition because we're not used to it. But eventually, it can become a normal thing. But we have to keep our eyes and our mind focused on all that God has done, all that he is doing, and all he plans to do. Amen? It's a constant battle. A constant battle. But you know, we can, if we have nothing else to rejoice in, you know what we can hold on to? If there's nothing going right in our lives, you know what we can hold on to? Our salvation. If we can't think of one little thing that we can well, that we can praise God for, if we have been saved by the cross of Christ, that's all that we need. You know why? Because that salvation has eternal implication. That salvation can help us endure through the hardest of trials. Why? Because we know that our eternal destiny, a hope that will be realized one day, is guaranteed. So as we draw closer to the end of times, which worries a lot of people, man, it gets me excited. It gets me excited. Why? Because I can see God working the events of history, and I know the promise that's coming. He will save his church, the ultimate salvation. So as we pray and stand together, if you don't have that eternal security in your life, make that certain today. But also I challenge you to rejoice in what God has done in your life. It's an occasion to rejoice because God has saved us. Father, we thank you for this time together this morning. Thank you for all that you've done, what you are doing, and what you plan to do. God, you're so good to us, God. Help us never to lose sight of our salvation and of your promises. God, it's so easy to be distracted. Forgive us, Lord, where we often fail you. Forgive us of our negative negativity, our negative thinking, Lord. I'm getting so down and depressed as we look at this world. But help us to look to you and see the joy of our salvation. There may be pain in the night, but God, thank you so much that joy comes in the morning. In Jesus' name.